Hey, welcome back everybody to another episode of PK's Lab. Got something special for you today. It's been something I've been meaning to do for a while. Life and springtime and all that other stuff kind of got in the way. Um, so, without further ado, we're going to look at the True DX. Joshua Bardwell was kind enough to purchase an additional True DX and mailed it to me. Um, so we're going to look at what the sync magic is going on. So I've got a couple wires wired in. Um, these go to the two individual video receivers. Um, looks like most manufacturers are sticking with like the standard uh, video receiver module pinout. Like they're not having anything custom designed as far as I can tell. Um, so makes it real easy to tap off the video signal uh, from the top and bottom receiver modules and see what the de demodulated FM video signal is looking like here before it does any of the processing and we'll also tap it off after the processing and uh, see what kind of magic they're doing in the middle to fix things up for us. So without further ado, let's uh, show you the setup. So if you've watched my previous videos on the Immersion RC Rapid Fire Modes Demystified, uh, you're going to kind of recognize this block diagram because it's basically the same setup. Uh, so what we got is a Fox Rear Falcor. I always forget if it's a C or a K, how you spell it, but um, it's, that's a nice camera because it lets us do PAL or NTSC. We can switch between it at runtime. We've got an oscilloscope probe, channel 1, yellow trace, uh, that's looking at that analog voltage. That goes into our Rodian Schwartz SMT-06 signal generator, and then that's plumbed into the FM modulator. The RF signal at 5 gigahertz. My handwriting's terrible, sorry about that. Goes through a power divider, um, and then goes through a variable attenuator. Each one of these paths are independently controlled. And then that's gonna go into our unit under test, the True DX. And we tapped off the analog video outputs from the upper and lower receivers directly when they come out. And then the final output, that's the combined output after they've done their processing and whatnot. And just like on the rapid fire video, this is our reference plane, which means that whatever value of power level is displayed on the signal generator and you subtract the attenuation here will result in the power level here. So if we say that the signal generator is saying minus 50 dBm and we've got 50 dB of attenuation, this is a minus 100 dBm signal here. All right. And... All right, let me show you in a video the actual physical setup. So from the top, we got our fail core hanging out up there. Comes around via wires, goes into the analog modulator. Got our frequency, power level. That comes out this blue cable, the RF cable. Comes down here. And the power divider, which goes into our two-channel electronically controlled attenuator. Comes up over into our True DX. And then we've got a couple wires dangling out. So these are our analog video feeds that we're tapping from the two channels and then the combined one. And then we've got our fat shark here with a USB camera looking into the goggles so we can actually see what's going on. And then up here is our oscilloscope with the four traces. We've got the yellow trace that's the direct output from the Falcor going into the signal generator. This is the upper receiver on the True DX, lower receiver on the True DX, and the combined video output signal. And we've got the oscilloscope line locked to the output from the Falcor. So even if we turn, I'm gonna come over here and turn the RF off, you can see that we get noise on all the traces, but the scope stays locked. So you can click it in and out. So that's the basics of our setup. So yeah, let's get testing. Oh. Actually, before we start testing, let's uh, let's do a quick crash course on the basics of what's going on in that analog video signal. Um, so I've turned off the other traces up here on the oscilloscope, and I've only left the output from the video camera itself. Um, and so you got to remember, uh, the analog video standards were developed uh, quite a ways back, um, and they were developed for a cathode ray tube that has an electron gun that sweeps back and forth and they vary the strength of the beam 
to change the brightness. So it's going do 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 scanning and boop, pops back up to the top and do 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 do. So there has to be signals in the video itself, or there has to be information encoded in into the video signal to let it know when it's reached the end of a line and has to pull the electron gun back. Um, so that's the horizontal blanking interval or horizontal blank. And then when it gets to the bottom of the screen, it has to have a, some signals to tell it to go to the top of the screen vertically. So that happens in the vertical blanking interval, VBI. Um, so those two things combine to make it scan and boop, pop back up to the top. So there's um, two sets of things here. You can see this is one field. Um, because the video is interlaced, there's two fields to make a frame, um, which means that this field is either the even lines or the odd lines of the image, and then this following one is the opposite of it. You can see here, these are the, the vertical blanking pulses. So if we look closely at them, they've got kind of a signature pattern like that. And then if we look a little closer, we can see there's these squiggles that pop in. These squiggles are the color bursts. So if this was a black and white video signal, we wouldn't see this particular portion of the waveform. It would just have the low step and the high step and continue on. Um, and the timing of these pulses and the, the way that color burst looks is different between PAL and NTSC because of the frame rates and, and how they encode color is different. So anyways, that's generally what we're looking for for the vertical blank. And then you can imagine these little short pulses that we see are the horizontals. So that's, that's one line of information. So as we go along a bunch of lines in, we start getting an actual video signal. This fail course is kind of funny. Uh, a couple lines in, it has like an almost full brightness um, portion, a line of video. Um, this will we'll come back to later, but it, most cameras don't do this, and then your actual video signal starts after that. So kind of going, going, going. We're going to zoom out, keep go, 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 and see the brightness of the scene, and then we start over again. So let's, uh, I think we're ready to go and uh, rip into the True DX here and see what we get. So, boop. Holy information overload. There's another screen with a bunch of stuff on it. So let's go through quickly what we've got. Um, oh, got to remember which way to point. That's the oscilloscope. Uh, this is the signal generator here. Um, obviously the Fat Shark camera, goggle, USB camera is over there. And then let's see, point the right way. So these two windows we'll be using to control the electronic attenuator we talked about before, the actual values of the attenuators you can see here as well, um, and in some cases, depending on which one's active, so like it might show up here, you can look for my mouse cursor there, or boop, 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 get the right one down here. So the, the, this depends on whether we're doing just straight attenuation. So let me show you what that looks like. I'm going to attenuate attenuation one, this guy, by moving this slider over. You can see the number increments, and you can see the RSSI bars changing for the upper receiver as we add attenuation. And I forgot if I mentioned it in the beginning of the video or not, um, the actual attenuation, or the actual signal strength at the radio is this, and you have to subtract this value. And that'll, that accounts for all the cable loss going up all the way up to the, the RF connector into the receiver itself. Everything is calibrated out for this specific frequency. So that's what we got going on. All right, so let's look at this waveform and see what they're doing. So first things first, we're just kind of going to look in. Oh, actually, I should show you. Make sure we're running the right firmware so we're all on the same page. Let's see if I can do this in here. All right, that guy showed up. So we're currently running from our version 1.2. That's the only one I have available. So this was a review unit purchased by Joshua Bardwell for me to, to mess around with. And actually, I have two of these 3DX units, 
Um, so we'll be able to do a little cross comparison now. Um, so make sure we're on race band eight. Group. All right. I did notice it does something funny. Once you activate the Bluetooth, it gives you that overlay view, and you have to like exit out of the menus to get stuff to to stay. All right. So on to the fun stuff. We're going to start by setting the Trudy to indoor mode. Oop, I set it right. And saving. All right, everybody's hunky dory. And we've got a signal. It looks to be good. So the thing to note is when it's doing the sync pulses or the vertical blanking interval, you can see that the the swing here is kind of important. The NTSC and PAL standard specifies roughly what this voltage should be. Um, and then values above it, let's, we'll go back a couple lines, you can kind of see we actually got a color signal or a video signal. We got that step up and that's kind of sets the black level, or actually a little bit above it sets the black level, and then you've got your video signal, but it never really goes down below kind of where that point is right there. Um, so that's kind of important when you're regenerating the sync pulses for the, the goggles to actually be able to lock onto it, that it has that those voltages kind of consistently appearing. So we're going to click off the RF. You can see it, the Trudy generates the low voltage, um, but for the higher part of the step, he actually creates like a clamped output. Um, and this is okay, because we're, right now, it's just trying to generate pure, you know, it's dealing with pure noise coming on both receivers. Um, and you can kind of see he's clamping it to kind of like the 0.3 volts above where the, the low edge of the sync pulse is. And this is all good, um, just kind of because what he's doing. Um, and you can see throughout the whole video frame, he's actually regenerating all the horizontal and vertical sync pulses, and he's still doing the OSD overlay as well, which you can kind of see flickering there in the Fat Shark goggle feed. Um, there's another kind of cool thing you can see in this view, and that's how the overlay is actually being generated. The overlay has uh, two kind of bit states, either well, it's probably three. It's transparent, it's either darkening the image or lightening the image. And you can kind of see that here where it's transparent, it's darkening the image, transparent, lightening the image. So that's kind of how they create that effect where you can still see through the OSD, but you can actually see the information as well. So they're just, there's an op amp and they're probably shifting the, the voltage, the video signal along the way. Um, this can make the video be out of spec when you do it this way, but they might be clamping it to kind of keep things in spec on the high side. Um, it doesn't look like they're clamping it on the low side, but I digress. It is what it is. It works. They're they're not doing anything too crazily uh, agrarious, however you say that. Now let's take a look at what they're doing in outdoor mode with the sync pulses. So we'll come over here. Switch things into outdoor mode. Do our save. Do do exit. Ta do the same thing. We turn the RF off. And here you can see it's uh, quite a bit different. Right? They're not really trying to get that low voltage kind of centered up. They're they're pulling the, the line, they're clamping it, but they're only clamping it one way, um, which is interesting. And they're still trying to do an overlay, kind of the, the same tricks they were doing before. It's almost like in indoor mode, the video signal at some stage is DC coupled, and um, in this particular stage, they're you know they're not clamping to the bottom, they're clamping to the top. Anyways. Um, let's take a look at how things look when we dial things down step by step. So we're going to switch back to indoor mode, turn our RF back on, Boop. 
Switch back to indoor mode. All right. Let's exit. And we're going to take our signal level down step by step. Again, both paths going to the Trudy are experiencing the same signal level. So you can hear there, you just lost the lock. And you can see now it's just purely, um, well, the question is, is this just RSSI diversity or is there something else going on once he loses lock and he lets out that beep, letting you know that he's lost lock. So what we're going to do is we're going to come over here to this GUI key press window in the lower right there. We're going to attenuate the second path. Give it 15 dB more attenuation. And we're going to slowly bring this up. So it really should only be using this upper receiver. So let's see if we can get lock back at some point with just one antenna, essentially, almost one antenna. Those clicks are actually the, the attenuators in the signal generator. They're mechanical, and when it changes a big step, it has to like move two of them at the same time and you get that pop. So that's normal. So we just got lock back. So it's around minus 80 dBm, 81, uh, at least on one antenna. Let's see how long it takes for him to hold on before he loses lock again. And again, the, all this work is done in indoor mode right now. Still holding on. <clears throat> So the question is, is this usable for somebody that's flying to have your image doing this? It's, I don't think it's as, oh, sorry, we just lost it there. I'm talking. All right, let's do the same test. So 15 dB of attenuation, but this time we'll do it on the first path. So this is interesting right out the gate. All right, so this... We've got a lot stronger signal. A lot. Not really. I mean, we're basically down at sensitivity of the module, but um, the second path should at least have some sort of video coming through, and it looks like it's only on the first path. So let's turn this up by a couple dB and see if we can get them to click in. So there, you just popped in at minus 95. And I went through the calibration uh, procedure on this the particular Trudy before I started these tests. So it looks like once he clicks on to that receiver, he stays with it. So there's some hysteresis there. And it looks like he's still using that second receive path because we can just barely make out things in the Fat Shark DVR or video screen. So at least the sensitivity of the module is good. The behavior coming out of sensitivity is a little funny, but I think it's okay. So what else can we do? I think we should try a handover. So we're going to basically alternate the attenuation between the two paths back and forth. And let's see how the Trudy handles that. And it looks like you got the lock back there. 
All right, so we got things set up for the handover here. Um, the important things to look out for is in the lower right hand corner, this uh, GUI handover window. The sliders will represent the attenuation on each path. So this upper slider, is, sorry, the left hand, yep, upper slider is the upper path, lower slider is the lower path. And you can also see the attenuation here. The actual live video streams are going to be a little bit out of sync with uh, everything that's going on because some of this is a USB webcam, some of them are Wi-Fi webcams, so everything's just a little bit out of sync. The important thing to to look at and take from this is our signal strength going into the receiver module will be minus 75 dBm minus whatever this attenuation is. And you can see in my settings here, the stop dBm is 50. So the crossover point when each one of these are at 25 dBm of attenuation will be around minus 100. So the sensitivity of both modules. So again, this is simulating a handover, not multipath. I, I do want to make that very clear. Um, multipath tends to have pops and clicks and things transition probably faster than what this is simulating. Um, but it, this will simulate a moment of time where both receivers will get a signal strength that's low enough that they're basically at their their sensitivity and then the, one of them will rise and the other one will fall past that point. So um, it'll be up to the module to kind of keep the sinks going while it's in that transition point and then whichever one's stronger, um, switch to that one hopefully fast enough um, and hopefully the sinks will have stayed, have been kept re being reproduced by the module so that your screen doesn't roll when that that stronger signal comes back in and starts taking over. So that's the setup. Let's uh, make sure we're running in indoor mode. Do, do. Indoor mode. And save. Exit. And we're actually going to do a three-way shootout. We're just going to do this indoor mode one just on its own, and then we're going to overlay indoor mode, outdoor mode, and then an immersion RC rapid fire so you can kind of see all three of them going at the same time. So yeah, let's do it. Click reset and click start. So you can kind of see it's doing its thing. Again, the crossover point is at sensitivity for these modules with this being at minus 75. And what we can actually do is if we reduce the signal strength in minus 80, that'll give it more time where it's below sensitivity of each module so that it's purely just the, when we're looking at these sync pulses being generated, that's actually the TrueDX generating those. So again, one thing to note is during when it's down at, in the noise, this upper value for the sync pulse is allowed to kind of wander around. Um. So one thing to note, you can kind of see that the rapid fire does a better job of keeping the screen from kind of tearing, but this is also what leads to its compatibility issues. So if we look at what it's doing here and the vertical blanking interval, like it's driving both the high and the low edges of the, the pulse on its own, irrespective of what the input video signal is doing. And this is what leads to its camera compatibility problems, you know, because if the timing of this doesn't line up with the timing of what the camera is actually putting out later on, you end up having an image that's rolling vertically because 
where the camera is outputting you know line number one no longer lines up with where the rapid fire is lining one outputting line number one and then you get this rolling effect um, so you don't see this on the Trudy because it doesn't it only drives one either the low edge or the high edge um, so it shouldn't have as many compatibility problems but it also won't keep the images stable if that makes sense um, because it's not fully regenerating the the vertical uh, sync pulse pulses so let's summarize the good stuff of what we've got so far um, the Trudy is not as aggressive at regenerating the sinks as a rapid fire is so that has a small potential advantage where some potentially non-compliant camera slash OSD setups that some people fly uh, will probably have a less of a chance, and I'm saying probably, have a less of a chance um, of having conflicts with what the Trudy hardware is doing with the sinks to recover it. But on the converse of that, um, it doesn't handle multipath situations as well. And the reason I say that, there's actually two things. Um, one of them is it's not doing as an aggressive job to regenerating that vertical sync, which means that uh, it's more up to the, the Fat Sharks video decoder to kind of keep that sync in, in line, keep the, the frame from rolling. And, you know, it it's only has so much information to go on, and it, it gives up a lot earlier than, than our, our fancy modules nowadays. Um, so that's a potential problem. And the second one is not so obvious unless if you're really staring at the oscilloscope traces as we were going along doing the testing. So if you watch my uh, rapid fire video, you'll see that they uh, are kind of continuously, when it's in rapid fire mode one, switching back and forth between the two signals and almost essentially averaging the two of them together um, until the RSSI on one of them gets significantly worse. There's a threshold in there. Um, it's kind of related to how, how they did it, but anyways, almost all the time when they're in mode one they're kind of blending the two signals together um, whereas the Trudy is behaving more like a traditional diversity with sync reproduction um, and it's not trying to combine the signals super fast um, again that has some advantages and it has some disadvantages um, so now that we got past that part I have been talking to Trudy about an issue I saw come up with their particular module, and it, it kind of relates to how they do the OSD, um, that bright and dark area that we talked about before. And it's it's a bug, in my opinion. They may not think it is. Uh, they haven't given me a definitive answer yet whether they're going to fix it or not fix it. So we're just going to go ahead and publish the results that we got and let you guys decide if it's worth your money or not to invest in a Trudy module. But basically, it goes like this. Um, so in those, actually, instead of talking about it, let's pull up the oscilloscope, because this video is long enough. What the heck? <laughs> uh, all right, back again with all the screens. On the right, we have, or actually above my head, to my right on the screen, we have uh, basically the video levels, the voltage levels for an average waveform, or the, what the standard specifies they should be. The column on the left here is what we care about. So there's a concept of a zero level voltage, um, and the swing of the sinks is like a, a 40 percent point, so it sets what the vertical scale is going to be for all the positive information above this. So what I've done on this oscilloscope up here, and I'll zoom into it for you, is I've changed the vertical scale of all the traces so that, and I actually turned off one of the traces. So what we've got here is this is the output from the camera, trace number one. Trace number two is the raw receive signal from the upper receiver of the Trudy X. And trace number four is the output from the Trudy X. And I've scaled all of the vertical scales. You can, you can see they're all different here so that we get that 40% step between the high and the low corresponds so that one division above it is 100%. 
if that makes sense. So full white should be one division line above where that point is right there for each one of these. All right. So the uh, we kind of talked about before, this Falcor camera does something funny in the beginning um, where it outputs basically a full white uh, signal. And you can see that the True DX is clamping it. Now, you say, well, hey, Paul, come on. It's, it's basically the same video signal. You know, it's like it's just a little chopped off. What, what difference does it make? Um, well, so color was added to analog video after uh, black and white. You know, it was a black and white TVs came first. So the color information gets lost because it actually swings, causes the analog signal to swing past that 100% point. And you can see it on the diagram on the right, too. All right. So as, as it steps down, it's, this is a staircase um, color pattern. So the first color is pure white with nothing on it. The next one is a yellow. And the intensity of the yellow is actually a little bit lower. And the high frequency information encodes the color. Well, what you end up having is you lose color information in these areas. Um, and it just becomes full white. And it's actually not full full white because again I told we talked about how I scaled these so that this minus 40% point would give us full 100% here so it's actually going to be a little bit less than full white um, and it's just kind of related to the thresholds that they chose internal to the module so in the going back and forth with uh, True DX or sorry uh, yeah Furious FPV <laughs> um, they basically thought that one of their power supplies was damaged um, in that first module that Joshua bought. So they sent me a replacement, and I did the same set of measurements, and it behaves exactly the same. Um, and then they suggested increasing the input voltage to the module from 5 volts to 6 volts, or 5 volts up, to see if the problem goes away. And it turns out that the problem does go away, and it's dependent on how much time your the camera that's on the other end spends, you know, how, how close to this true white level it ends up sending out. Um, so it, the, I'll show you a couple examples here, but the uh, digital CMOS cameras I have, they tend to be able to, you know, basically saturate that signal if there's a bright object in the scene a lot more than the analog cameras, the uh, CCD cameras. So the problem with that whole six volt thing is that, well, we already know in our Fat Shark goggles, we're lucky if we get five volts in the module. It's actually usually a, bit, a little bit less. In my goggles, I've got the L1 and L10 mod done, and I'm usually at 4.8 volts to the, the module. And so if you ever look at DVR footage, which we'll look at in a second, um, the DVR footage from a True DX just kind of looks eh, muddy and not so clear because um, the video signal itself is not, you know, they're losing the information in the module. So you're, you're, you lose essentially contrast in your image. So let's look at some examples of that. Well, hopefully that was informative and fun for you guys. Um, yeah, sorry it was such a rambling adventure. Um, yeah, I'll see you probably in another episode of the, the lab, the PK's lab here. And my little buddy Beep Beep was uh, kind enough to be hanging out with me here today. Um, he's kind of disappointed I didn't have him play with him all day. I've had
had him in the box recording all this stuff. So, beep beep says hi to the internet. All right, I'll see you guys next time.